<sighs> yeah, I think we all saw this one coming. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored review time again. It's Marvel vs. DC, or as it's known in English, DC vs. Marvel. So last year, I did Amalgam Comics Month. It was fun! Fusions and amalgamations and combinations are a cool idea that can stretch the creative muscles on how to incorporate two different or even similar characters into one. But of course, Amalgam wasn't an exercise in a vacuum. It was a result of the comic book fight of the century. The never-ending battle between fandoms. The Kirk versus Picard of superhero universe debates. DC Comics or Marvel Comics? What, of course, the clear answer was cross-gen. I'm kidding, of course. Nobody remembers CrossGen. Okay, okay, I'm really kidding that time. I kid CrossGen. I... Oh, wow, in 16 years of doing this, I don't think I've ever talked about CrossGen. Um, anyway, Marvel vs. DC, DC vs. Marvel. Both titles were used, and all the better for it. Back in the pre-internet days, when it was rumored the two versions of King Kong vs. Godzilla existed, the popular rumor was that you could tell which version it was by whose name was up front, and I can see that kind of logic carrying over to fans. Whoever gets their name on the book first is the one who will win through. But yeah, anyway, I did Amalgam Comics Month last year, and I talked a little about how this came about. That in the wake of the speculator boom, Marvel and DC were looking for ways to recover, and DC executive editor Mike Carlin and Marvel executive editor Mark Grunewald came together with the idea. The concept of the book, two brothers for lack of a better term, coming together to both oppose and acknowledge the greatness of the other was evidently a nod to those editors, according to Peter David. David and Ron Mars were tapped to write it since they each had ties to both companies. Once they had the initial idea of the brothers, they started coming up with the actual matchups. According to the oral history of the story written a few years ago, Superman wouldn't be going up against Spider-Man because that would be a really short fight. It'd also be really redundant given the two have fought once before, and I've already covered that one. When initially conceived, John Romita Jr. and Jose Luis Garcia Lopez would handle the art, but for some reason it didn't come about. Garcia Lopez saying he was only offered the chance to do art for the Doctor Strange Fate Amalgam comic. Adam and Andy Kubert were approached, but according to Ron Mars, they evidently said no because they were too busy on the X-Men books at the time. Instead, Dan Jurgens and Claudio Castellini were brought in. We've seen Jurgens' great art before, but Castellini was actually a bit newer to the American market, more known in Italy. He said that he thinks Marvel was trying to push him into the big leagues by giving him the assignment. Given that this is the first time I've ever mentioned him before on the show, I don't think that quite ended up happening. Rest assured, I don't mean that as an insult, his art is fine. I'm just saying that if it was Marvel's goal to propel him into superstardom with the book, I don't really think that happened. The initial plan was for David and Mars to alternate writing every eight pages, but the result was apparently god-awful, so they split it up so that they both took two issues each. What's more, since the book was the quintessential embodiment of who would win in a fight nerd arguments, there would be five fights decided by voting, with the creators having to make two versions of the fights in case one or the other won said vote. The Ballots were distributed to comic book stores in advance of the printing, and then sent in. Unfortunately, the voting efforts were skewed by third-party fight contestants on the ballots. 
We'll talk about the results of those fights when we actually get to them, but yeah, if you haven't seen them already, check out Amalgam Comics Month from last year to learn some more details about the crossover, as well as the Amalgam books themselves. This was originally on the Never Gonna Review It list because back in the day I felt it was good and I didn't review good comics back then. Do I still think that's the case? Well, let's dig into Marvel vs. DC and find out. Reading from a trade, no deep look at the covers, not that there's much to say since they're mostly just collages and group shots of the respective stable of characters. We open in Manhattan, where Ben Riley in the sensational Spider-Man costume, this was during the Clone Saga, and as I said in the Spider-Boy review, they decided to set the book in the present for both universes as a gateway for new readers, is swinging around. I love this town. Just when you've had it, when you think you can't take any more from the Big Apple, it gives you an honest-to-God quiet night for a change. Anyway, thanks for listening to me, Air that I'm talking out loud to. Nights like this, I know I did the right thing coming back to New York and getting my life together, putting on the costume again. Well, a costume anyway. Damn nudity laws! Maybe without the mask, I'm still going by the name Ben Riley, but this is who I really am. It feels good being Spider-Man. Yep, I'm gonna be Spider-Man forever! I see nothing but good things happening to Ben Riley for the next 30 years! What the hell is this pose he's in here? It's like you took a Barbie doll and put all its limbs as far apart as possible. Anyway, his spider sense goes off when he passes over a homeless guy sleeping next to a box. Nothing in the alley but a grubby looking guy in a cardboard box. Ah, huh, bunch of lights coming out of a box. <gasps> There's a raven there! Yeah, I think Dan Jurgens may have had a miscommunication here since Spidey says it's glowing, but the beams of light are pretty obvious to spot and yet not commented on. Hold on, why is the box glowing? Ah, don't worry, it's just preheating. One of the beams of light hits Spidey and he's suddenly teleported away. A man walking down the street spots the light from the alley and enters, waking up the homeless guy. He puts his hands on the box as if trying to hold back the lights. So soon, it's starting. But at least you're here! Phil Swift, you're here! The Flex Tape Man! Hand me the Flex Tape! He says he needs the guy's help, but he just walks away, not wanting any part of this. Smartest guy in the Marvel Universe right here. Ben wakes up in the rain, confronted by, of all people, the Joker. And I was about to make a joke about how the Joker met Peter's Spider-Man in a different Marvel and DC crossover, but the Joker actually makes that comment for me. Spider-Man, I presume? But you've changed tailors since last we tangoed. Also, that was one of those weird ones where we pretend Marvel and DC were always the same universe, so it's kind of odd that I acknowledge it now. Ben is confused by the presence of a clown in New York, but the Joker says that they're in Gotham City. Dear boy, this fair gem is Gotham, famed far and wide for its flying rodents and murderous disfigured psychotics. And that's just the local government! When the Joker starts talking about blowing up the building they're standing on, Spidey demands answers, but the Joker just hands him his card and steps off, parachuting away before Spidey can web him. In a great transition from Spidey holding the Joker card to Gambit charging one in his hand, we cut back to the Marvel Universe, where the X-Men are fighting Juggernaut, only for Juggernaut to suddenly teleport away and punch a building. Namely, the Daily Planet. A confused juggernaut suddenly finds himself getting punched by Superman. I don't know who you are or where you came from, but I do know you're in the wrong place, mister. If you're gonna punch buildings, you're gonna do it over there, because over there needs to take care of its own problems. It seems that my flex tape joke wasn't that off the mark, since the homeless guy has indeed sealed up the cardboard box with tape, but this is why infomercials can be deceptive since the light once again starts piercing out of it, the tape ribboning away from the box. And it follows on like that, page after page of characters from their respective universes getting teleported to the other universe. And while some heroes get only one page, the X-Men, who were very popular at the time, get two pages, with Wolverine, Gambit, and Storm disappearing after reporting on Juggernaut's disappearance. We actually see things from the opposite end in the Batcave as Bullseye has teleported in and is holding a knife to to the Tim Drake Robbins head. I don't know how you got in here, but we can end this without anyone getting hurt. But first you have to put down the knife and let the boy go. I get it. You probably listened to some rock and roll music and it made you murderous and violent. It's the same with me. Bullseye just says that there was a light and now he's here. I'm here in this cave and I don't know how I got here. So you tell me, you tell me where I am. You tell me who you are. If you hurt the boy, I am your worst nightmare. I am the Batman, and I'm not wearing hockey pants. 
Somehow, Tim manages to maneuver himself in such a way that he elbows Bullseye in the neck, giving Batman an opening for his Batarang, but Bullseye catches it and tosses it back. But this is Batman, so our hero actually manages to duck it. And all of a sudden, everything is yellow? Oh great, did we slip into Ass Bar and Batman dropped a bucket of yellow paint on everything? Batman punches Bullseye out. You hit even harder than... than Daredevil. Damn you! And your... lemonade! The two are naturally confused where the hell he came from, especially since he seemed just as surprised, but then Robin gets teleported away. Right into the room of Jubilee. Jubes? Were you expecting a boy to be delivered? Man, Amazon delivery is more impressive than I thought. Some time has passed as we see that in Metropolis, Four Freedoms Plaza has teleported in as if it was always there, and Clark Kent has to deal with the new editor-in-chief of the Daily Planet, J. Jonah Jameson. People are coping with all the weirdness going on out there, but they want to know what's happening. Clearly this is all Spider-Man's fault, so you tell Jimmy Olsen to get me some pictures of him, damn it! Lois exposits that some mysterious publisher bought out the planet and fired Perry. Oh god, the version of Superman they've merged with is from Superman 4! Soon the summit will be kaput! Jimmy Olsen at the time was actually a TV reporter for WGBS, and he stops by to do a story on Perry White's firing, saying the front desk also wants someone to show around the new photographer for the planet. Lois volunteers as Clark looks over some recent photographs of crossovers and writes up a story. We see a montage of them as the news article plays out, with the basic question of, what the hell is going on? Still, fun shots of Steel fighting the Absorbing Man, Green Lantern vs. Green Goblin, Captain America vs. Bane, Daredevil vs. the Riddler, which just puts in my head the idea of the Surgeon General fighting Hush. And wow, I think that's the first time I've mentioned the Surgeon General in like 15 years. I'd ask if anyone remembers her, but I checked a second ago, and indeed, she never appeared outside of that two-parter I reviewed back in the day, so no, nobody remembered her. Anyway, other fun fights that we sadly don't get full versions of. Batman vs. Venom, Captain Marvel vs. Doctor Doom. Doom refuses to call you Shazam! You had the Captain Marvel name originally, and Doom will respect your place in history! And it goes on like that. I could list them all off, but it's just cool to see even if it's limited to only these single panel shots. Kinda wish this book was longer to expand on them. Yes, as the creators described when they were making this, it's more about the fights than anything else, a big budget popcorn action flick versus anything of substance, but the fun of a crossover is seeing the characters interacting. Seeing them side by side is great, but seeing them interacting is better. The final shot of the montage is Spider-Man webbing up the man-bat, which Clark is impressed by. Lois introduces Clark to the new photographer who took that shot, Ben Riley, who says that Peter Parker is his professional name. Maybe between the two of us we can figure out what's happening. Oh, I don't know about that. I think it'll take somebody bigger than either of us to really grasp it. I'm thinking Godzilla. He's technically a Marvel character. And we see these two bigger forces contemplating just that. On the DC side, the Spectre. On Marvel side, the Living Tribunal. Both realize that reality is shifting, and by beings more powerful than either of them. We end part one as we witness those beings about to poke each other. Does this bug you? I'm not touching you. We open with a guy from last issue who the homeless guy had asked for help, Axel Asher, as we see the two cosmic beings are in his eyes. Some people can handle cool custom contact lenses, and then there's me who can handle none. The narration recounts an incident as a child when Axel found his sister playing with their father's gun and took it away from her, only to accidentally shoot himself. That was a long time ago. The only outward reminder is Axel's slight limp but he carries the anger and pain within him. Also, his irises transformed into weird alien head things, a lesser known side effect of being shot in the leg. It was the most traumatic thing that ever happened to him, until they appeared in his consciousness with an enmity that made his sisters and his pale in comparison, and with enough pain between them to level a universe. Although in their case, it's because one took away the other's nerf gun from them. We're still in Yellow Land for some reason, as Axel, sweating and disoriented from the visions of the two beings, tries to get back into his car, but a cop comes along assuming he's drunk or high. However, the cop himself is soon accosted by another cop who says they've never seen them before. They also are confused whether they're in New York or Gotham City. Bursts of light, fake cops, it's like the whole city is going down the sewer. Bursts of light? 
Ugh, that's why this city is a hellhole. And even that is soon interrupted by Wolverine and Killer Croc busting out of a manhole fighting each other. Axel flees as, inexplicably, Clark Kent and Ben Riley are nearby doing... some kind of story, and both thinking they need to ditch the other to change into their suits. It's like the setup to a romantic comedy. Both are dating, both are secretly superheroes, and don't know that's the case for the other. There have been any number of times when Axel Asher has felt the need to move on to Rome. Having a manhole cover be thrown through his windshield is, expectedly, one of those times. Although weirdly it looks like he drove away in the damaged car even though we saw him flee the car upon that whole windshield damage from manhole cover thing. Or maybe he just decided, eh, I guess I'm stuck here for a while, I'm gonna get some cash from this ATM then. To continue his search for that goal which he cannot even name, and thus he names it Snuffle flob. Axel tries to withdraw his money from the ATM to once again go on the road, but because of the merged universes, the ATM isn't working for him. Account not recognized? What is this? PC load letter? What the fuck does that mean? However, he suddenly realizes he's back near the alley with the homeless guy in his magic box and goes to take a look. Finally, you got your tail back here! Took you long enough! What? is that? Look, my Solid Snake cosplay has gotten really out of hand and I need some help here. Ah, oh, for crying out loud, when there's a universe to save, you can't stop for exposition! Nonsense. Talking's a free action. After a quick check-in with the tease of Thanos versus Darkseid, we start seeing some more complete fights coming together. But first... Excuse me, sir. I don't understand. I was in this store yesterday, and none of this stuff was here. Wasn't this a Hanna-Barbera store? What happened to the display of X-Men stuff? Well, in an effort to drive up sales, Pinky and the Brain ended up joining the team. Turns out Pinky was their most successful leader to date. Is it weird that the X-Men evidently merchandise themselves? Anyway, with Wolverine and Killer Croc's fight smashing into the store, Nightwing overhead watches this and decides to intervene, not realizing that Gambit is behind him charging a card. Storm meets up with Wonder Woman, though this is a bit early for their fight. Weird. Bane, meanwhile, prepares to break Captain America's back, mocking him for tossing his shield away, but of course, all those who oppose his shield must yield, so it boomerangs back and hits Bane right in the back of the head, knocking him down. To continue our streak of heroes watching each other doing stuff, Batman abandons chasing after the lizard, and instead goes to Nightwing's aid. Back in the alleyway, the homeless guy asks if Axel is gonna help. What... what is that? Duct tape! First law of the universe! Can never have too much duct tape! This is a weird episode of the Red Green Show. As the energy overflows, Gambit and Wolverine have escaped from Batman and Nightwing by stealing the Batmobile. Feel like it shouldn't be easy to do that. We also get a quick flash to the Batcave to see the Mole Man invading it. It's like two supervillains in the Batcave. I thought the DC Earth was supposed to be physically bigger than the Marvel one. So why does it feel so small? Batman figures they'll follow Wolverine and Gambit to see where they go and maybe get some answers, particularly where Robin is. And we see that Robin is in no rush to leave Jubilee's room as he's just sitting and talking with her about how much she loves his fashion sense. And assuming time is moving at the same rate between worlds, they've been doing this for hours now. But enough of that scene, time to finally advance the plot. All of the heroes get a bright light in front of them, the duct tape shockingly not being enough to hold back everything in the homeless guy's box. I tried to hold it back, tried to do the job I've had for ages, but it's no good. The brothers have noticed each other. The battle's joined! The Smash Brothers tournament has begun! Ain't nothing you or I can do now except hold on and try not to go nuts from what you're about to see! They're dogs! And they're playing poker! Ah! And then, real unreality floods him, and he hears a million voices as one. My god! A million Twitter bots are telling me about the nudes in their bios! And thus we have reached the exposition that we didn't have time for before. In the beginning, there were two entities. Brothers, although they were also sisters, sexless, and everything in between. Lots of whiny idiots declare that these two entities have gone woke. They were yin and yang, good and evil, the main you. Uh, I know you're going for a balance thing, but describing them as good and evil implies that one of these two companies is the bad guy, and I don't think that's a wise thing to imply. Well, okay, you could argue that sometimes one company is being less evil than the other, but sometimes both are evil and both are good, so... Mm. They encompassed the whole of everything, except each other. Each was simply me, which made things complicated when people talked about them in social settings. 
This led the two to battle, and their respective universes were destroyed and reborn as a result of that fight. Eventually, they recovered, but without any memory of the other. But now, due to recent cosmos-shaking events that tore the fabric of the universe and redefined reality, the brothers have become aware of each other once more. I'm guessing the events they're referring to are Zero Hour and Age of Apocalypse, which were the most recent big stories at the time that involved rewriting history. Though Age of Apocalypse is iffy because of how time travel is supposed to work in Marvel, creating an alternate universe instead of altering the main timeline, although I don't think they really stick to that rule anymore. In the aftermath of their original battle, some of their uniqueness ended up in the other and vice versa, meaning the two beings were no longer wholly themselves. And that pissed them off! They want to be uniquely their own beings again, and can't stand the other being around. However, because of how badly their last fight went, they've decided that instead of direct combat, they're going to choose representatives of their respective universes to battle each other instead. Whoever scores more victories gets to survive. The other, and in turn their universe, goes kablooey. However, they also recognize that some of these fights could go on forever, given the combatants, so an additional rule. Whoever immobilizes their opponent first is the victor, the equivalent of pinning someone in wrestling. Wait, wait, what's that? What's that music? Oh my god, it's Valiant Comics with the money in the bank contract! Each pair of heroes will be summoned when it's their time to fight, and they have to fight because the alternative is the brothers trying to fight instead, and that's potentially devastating to both sides. It's honestly a pretty great way to explain why these fights are happening beyond simple misunderstandings. We need bigger stakes at play to ensure that a story all about who would win kind of fights actually has those fights. And everyone in both universes saw all that and understood it. Which again makes it kind of disappointing that this miniseries isn't longer, since I can see a lot of of subplots about some characters joining in the fights, or some trying to flee either reality for fear of it losing, you know, that kind of thing. Back in the alley, the homeless guy gives his own exposition dump about why the two of them in the box are significant. As stated before, parts of the brothers were lost during their first conflict. Those shards of themselves took on different forms. Some became self-aware of all this, like the homeless guy. Some become alive, go insane with that knowledge. Others just wandering around feeling like they're missing something and some become vortexes of power, opening up interdimensional gateways, and the box is one of those gateways. But enough of all that, time for the fights! First up is Captain Marvel versus Thor, who very sadly is wearing his mid-90s outfit. Bluish green, a big galaxy warrior's harness on his chest, whatever you call that head mask thing that exposes the face but leaves the hair to flow out, and lots of random leather straps. There. Sure glad I don't look stupid in this. I know I use that clip already in the Amalgam reviews, but it's just that bad an outfit. The two introduce each other, and since they both possess the power of gods, do the most appropriate thing before this battle. Pray. Oh, mighty myself, I pray I give myself the strength to fight. Oh, I'm giving myself the strength? Oh, great, thanks me. I'm very welcome. And by time for the fights, I of course meant let's check in on other characters first, as we see Darkseid and Thanos finally confronting each other. A disciple of death versus a lord of destruction. Tell me then, Darkseid, do you care to make a wager on the outcome? I wager, you pale imitation of me, that you will lose. Don't you mean purple imitation? Lois Lane, after being annoyed by overhearing people taking bets on the outcome of the universe-destroying battles, is grabbed by Scarecrow and Scarecrow. Yeah, Marvel actually has their own version of Scarecrow, lesser known, obviously, than DC's. The reason is mostly he's just not that interesting a character, originally starting as an Iron Man villain, but it's neat to see the team up regardless. Although I'm pretty sure they swapped the dialogue balloons because it should be DC's Scarecrow pointing out that she's a valuable hostage, not Marvel's. Not that it matters either way, since Ben Riley soon shows up and kicks them in the face. Anyway, quick cameo by Snapper Carr and Rick Jones taking bets on Captain Marvel vs. Thor as we actually get into the fight. Naturally, the heroes don't want to battle, but they really have nothing else they can do as they duke it out in an amusement park. Thor brings a Ferris wheel down on Captain Marvel, but he transforms back into Billy Batson to squeeze out of the debris. Billy calls down the lightning again to transform back, but Thor swings Mjolnir in the path of it to block it. He succeeds, and Billy is knocked out, but Mjolnir disappears. But where is mighty Mjolnir? Did the otherworldly lightning somehow short-circuit my hammer? Hello, Steve, god of tech support? And where did it end up? 
Right in front of Wonder Woman, who reads the If He Be Worthy line, confused how it judges that as she tries to pick it up, but gets zapped. Time for fight number two. Aquaman versus Namor the Submariner. Namor, of course, is grumpy and arrogant, while Aquaman is snarkier and able to evade his attempted punches. However, because they're so evenly matched in the water, Namor finally manages to land a hit that sends Aquaman flying out of said water. Next up is Flash versus Quicksilver. And unfortunately, this is a fight that really only works on paper. Oh yeah, DC's speedster and Marvel's speedster. Makes perfect sense. Problem is that... Yeah, they're both super fast, but the Flash is still faster. It's like comparing how fast a bullet shoots versus the speed of light. Yeah, both are faster than any human, but there's still a difference. Admittedly, the actual speed of both varies depending on comic to comic and creator to creator, but the Flash has been fast enough to phase through solid objects, occasionally time travel, or hop dimensions depending on the situation. It's just no contest. The only reason it looks briefly like Quicksilver might win is when a truck carrying gasoline crashes and Wally takes a moment to save the occupants, leaving an opening for Quicksilver to attack, but he hesitates upon thinking how much of a dick move it is to attack someone right after they help save people, and Wally is able to get the victory. Back to the Kings of Atlantis, the fight is now in, like, Sea World or something. Aquaman tangles Namor up in his hook and cable arm, but it's not enough to immobilize him. The bad news is the cord is unbreakable. The good news is I'm dazzled by your coiffure. I'm not. Namor just slicks his hair back, dude. I think your hair is more impressive, Arthur. Have you no respect for the stakes for which we battle? Respect? Namor, if I dwell on it too much, I'll curl up into a ball until it's over. So you'll pardon me if I keep my sanity and focus my own way. Through song, of course! Namor declares he's hardly immobilized, but as Aquaman has been the butt of so many jokes before, he has the power to talk to sea life, which he does by having a killer whale drop on Namor to immobilize him. That's your weakness, Namor. You're too noble to cheat. I, however, am a complete asshole lacking any nobility. I guess we're the evil universe. Back at the Daily Planet, Lois thanks Ben for saving her. My hero. Jeez, I think she wants me. Ben, don't be like those jackasses who think they're being flirted with by a store employee because they're smiling at them. We learn that the mysterious publisher who bought the Daily Planet is none other than the Kingpin. What is this? My employees lollygagging about? I do not approve. If we're all just being casual here, then I'm going to change into one of my numerous Speedos. We end out part two with... Frankly, some not great teases of things to come, since it's stuff we've already seen. Save for Wonder Woman wielding the power of Thor. Which also makes her midriff disappear, too. So I guess Mjolnir's just into stomachs right now for some reason. We begin part three with Jubilee writing in her diary to recap the events of the story so far. Sorry I haven't written. To tell you the truth, things have been kind of crazy. My animated series got revived. A few weird things here or there, but pretty good after four or five episodes. Something the montage shows, but sadly we never see in full are a few more team-ups. Black Widow and Black Canary, Doctor Doom and the Cyborg Superman, Iron Man and Steel, just a few cool moments that have been great to see, but of course the problem with this being only four issues. Also, Daredevil is just on his own. What the hell? Another confusing bit is how apparently people know ahead of time who the matchups are gonna be because of the betting boards. Did the brothers show everyone that? Anyway, Robin and Jubilee are gonna be fighting each other, and they know it and are not happy about it going for a brief walk before getting teleported to their fight. As good as Jubilee is, Robin was trained by Batman, so the fight's over pretty quick with him having tied her up. He didn't even have to land a punch. That's so lame. God, no, I was never planning to hit you. Kick you, maybe. I mean, have you seen these legs? I've got to show them off. Another quick fight is the Kyle Rayner Green Lantern versus Silver Surfer. Like with Spider-Man and Batman, the two actually had a previous crossover team-up that they acknowledge in the dialogue, apparently serving as the prequel to this big crossover. Still, it ends with the two of them colliding into each other and Kyle knocked out. The Green Lantern ring is powerful, but this is the power cosmic we're talking about. The victory is mine. Yet never have I more regretted an opponent's defeat. I mean, aside from that rib-eating contest, that was a mistake. Anti-heroes are also a part of this, so we then have Elektra versus Catwoman. I don't even know what I'm doing here. Nobody ever accused me of being a hero. Or being able to put my feet flat on the ground. Yeah, Claudio Castellini seems to be imitating that quirk of Jim Balance Catwoman, since she always seems to be drawn in high heels, even if... 
you know, there are no heels on those boots. Anyway, Electra opts to not kill Catwoman because this wasn't a fight of her choosing, but does drop her into a big industrial container of sand. Saved by kitty litter. At the Daily Planet, Ben tries to ask Lois out on a date, but she reveals she's engaged to Clark. Oh man, I didn't know. I'm sorry. Jeez, you could squash me like a bug, Clark. Superman can squash Spider-Man like a bug. Ben retreats to the dark room out of embarrassment, but then finds himself being teleported away for his battle. No rest for Lois and Clark, though, as Jameson comes in. Word just came in! The Hulk and some freak named Metallo are bashing each other around downtown. Innocent lives at risk, property damage, the makings of a great story. Somehow connected to Spider-Man and it will be perfect! As Clark heads out to deal with it, we cut back to the alley. Axel doesn't believe what he's being told. You're just some crazy homeless guy, that's all. Am I? I mean, I am homeless and a guy, so two out of three ain't bad, but still. And that's just a cardboard box? I mean, if it isn't, then I'm confused why you thought the duct tape would be effective. He grabs Axel's hand, which transforms his outfit into some kind of weird blue and red ensemble, somewhat resembling the brothers. What did you do to me? Unleashed what's inside of you! A fashion model! Strike a pose! Each of us chooses the guys best suited to who we are. This is mine, that's yours. I am best suited to smelling like I sleep in urine-soaked alleyways. You're best suited to being a revamp of the Golden Age Daredevil. You know, I think I got the short end of the stick here. The homeless guy has been the keeper of the gateway between the two universes and made it look like a box because he wants it to look like a box. But it might be different for Axel. Because you're next in the long succession of keepers. My time is almost up. You have to take up the mantle. You have become the access. And by that I mean you need to become the access point. You're basically walking Wi-Fi now. Everything's been leading to this moment. Your watch is more crucial than any that have come before. Make sure it's a digital one. Ooh, with a calculator built in. It falls to you to preserve the balance between the two universes. If one has a politically charged event comic, the other must have one. If a major character dies in one and comes back six months later, the other must do so as well. We cut to the next fight. And it's a controversial one. Wolverine versus Lobo. The two stab at each other for a bit and fall behind a bar. It's silent, and then Wolverine gets up and smokes a cigar. The thing about some of these fights is that they're glorified popularity contests. Wolverine is more popular than Lobo, so Wolverine will win. And a lot of people, including creators, found this ridiculous. The logic basically is that Lobo goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Superman, so Wolverine should have had no chance against someone that strong. I have However, I'm not bothered by this for three reasons. One, sure, Lobo tussles with Superman, but Wolverine has taken on the Hulk multiple times. It's not like he's never had to fight someone physically stronger than him before, and I'm sure he's learned a thing or two about how to handle that. Two, the fights are not about killing your opponent, it's about incapacitating them. We don't see what goes on behind that bar, so maybe Wolverine put a claw in Lobo's ear, incapacitating him for a few seconds before his own healing factor kicked in, but it was enough to give him the win. And three, possibly the most important aspect of all this, none of these characters are real. A writer can contrive any reason whatsoever for one character to beat another. A Teletubby can knock out Darth Vader if the writer wants to. Now you can argue that the way it happens isn't well written, the execution of how it happens so ridiculous that it doesn't work, but I think the way we see it here is perfectly fine. If Quicksilver had won the voting, I don't doubt that they would have had Flash being distracted by the exploding truck be how it was done. It's one of the reasons why the who would win in a fight style of discussion in nerd circles doesn't usually interest me. As a writer myself, the important part is figuring out how they do it, not if they can or not. Wolverine beats Lobo because Wolverine kicked him in the junk and that incapacitated him for a bit. Boom, done. It may not be satisfying for a lot of people, but it gets us to the end goal if said end goal is just Wolverine has to win. Speaking of, that brings us to Wonder Woman vs. Storm. And wow, now that we see the Thorified Wonder Woman outfit in full, it's even worse. What the hell is going on with that silver metal thong on her crotch? Why did the power of Thor take away so much of her clothes? Ha 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 ha. Your costume is ridiculous. Mjolnir is a pervert. That's the best explanation I got. Anyway, Diana can feel the power of a god coursing through her. But I warn you, 
I too have been called a goddess, and the lightning is at my command as well. And I'm actually wearing pants! Wendy considers the power would allow her an easy victory over Storm, and as such drops the hammer. It wouldn't be fair. And I wonder if this is a case where if the voting had gone the other way, she would have kept the hammer. And sadly, this is the weakest of the fights. Storm blows some wind at Wendy. Wendy grabs her leg. Storm zaps Wendy twice. And fight over. I don't doubt that Storm could defeat Wonder Woman, but this fight was kind of pathetic in my opinion. Next fight, clone against clone. It's Spider-Man versus Superboy, and it's definitely a better showing. So, what's your story, kid? You Superman's kid brother? Second cousin? What? I'm a clone. Try to grasp the concept. A clone? Yeah, a clone. I'm you, and you're me, and this is a god. A combination of impact webbing and sending Superboy into a fuse box knocks out the Boy of Steel. Speaking of super people, Superman arrives to help the Hulk punch out Metallo, though this is during one of the times where Bruce was the dominant mind in the Hulk, so while he's a bit grumpier, he's not the brutish Hulk. Which I'm sure contributed to some people's perceptions that Superman could beat this Hulk, but not the regular one. The two are teleported away to the Grand Canyon for their fight. We must have been sent here so no innocents could be in danger. And Bruce punches him. Let's just get down to it. The incredibly rude Hulk! They exchange some punches, Supes uses the heat vision, but ultimately Superman wins by just being relentless. A ton of punches and then collapsing a mountain on top of him. He took everything I had and almost stood up to it. Nothing left now except the waiting. Also to heal my spine. Ow, I twisted myself hard punching you like that. We cut to the Manhattan sewers for our final fight. Captain America versus Batman. Batman melts into the shadows so easily. Like he's a part of them. I can't fight what I can't find. And Batman drops down and kicks him. <laughs> the two acknowledge that they're pretty evenly matched in terms of physical skill and strength. And it sucks that they used to be on the same side. We're still on the same side. Only the circumstances have pitted us against each other. Another time, I can see us as partners. Oh yeah? Well how do you feel about VHS tapes? Uh, not fond of them. I actually prefer Betamax. M my brother. Batman wants to try to pursue some way of circumventing the brothers, but Cap doesn't see a way out of this situation, saying that they need to follow this through to the end. However, this is a case where the fight has to be decided by environmental factors. The sewer system flushes, knocking Cap off so that when he and Batman throw their respective projectiles at each other, Cap misses and he almost drowns. Batman saves him and brings him up to the street. Still, he was incapacitated long enough for him to lose, and thus the Marvel Universe loses. However, what a dink! They ended up in the alley along with Axel and the homeless guy, who says they can use the two heroes since each one is from their respective universes. Axel, who as we said before is now called Access, touches the two heroes and makes them glow. The battles are over, and only one universe is being spared, but not the winning universe. Marvel is being bailed out by Disney at the last second. One universe is being eliminated, but not the losing universe. Sucks to be you, Defiant Comics. The two brothers instead settle the contest their own way, fusing together into a combined being, and thus fusing the two universes to create the Amalgam Universe. All the Amalgam comics in between just serve to show the combined universe, save for one. Doctor Strange Fate, where the good doctor found Access still alive and wandering the fused world and tried to destroy him to prevent him from separating the universes again, since it would destroy his own. He fails and Access escapes, promising to restore the previous universes. Also, we get this reveal that Doctor Strange Fate is a triple fusion, since he's also Charles Xavier and this is treated as if it's a big deal. But anyway, let's get to the final issue of DC vs. Marvel, where we open with our old pal Darkclaw chasing Hyena through the streets of New Gotham. Hyena, I'm warning you! Well now, thanks for the warning, Dark Meat. But I'm going to click this fishing scam link anyway. I live dangerously! He deflects some of Dark Claw's explosives at a crowd of people, but the explosion is stopped by Super Soldier, who comes in to assist. Isn't it fun when they shout your name in fear? Fear I can relate to. I never quite got the hang of fun. Especially when it takes like three hours to polish these claws. 
Down in an alley below them, the homeless guy is looking much worse for wear, almost decaying now. He realized now that the brothers aren't the ones who merged the two universes together. Rather, it was the Spectre and the Living Tribunal, their last-ditch effort to save both universes and are holding it all together. But the brothers have become aware of what's going on and they're not happy. Access somehow is witnessing this in action and yeesh, this is pretty big cosmic imagery here. Kudos on the scale and effects of what is essentially just two guys holding each other his arms. The sight of it is too much for access and he instinctively teleports back to the homeless guy. Jeez, what happened to you? Well, turns out the Amalgam Universe's homeless problem is like double than how bad it is in their respective universes. Who'd have thought? The homeless guy says that he manipulated things to get Dark Law and Super Soldier here. Now the rest is up to him. He grabs access and gives him the rest of his power as he dies. Bye, kid. By the way, my name's Morty. Glad we met. Mostly because that means this crappy job is yours now. Sucks to be you. Time to become a force ghost or something. Hyena comes out as Morty vanishes and tries to threaten Access, but he just uses his newfound power to teleport him somewhere else. You! Where the hell is Hyena? It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. It don't matter. None of this matters. He grabs the two heroes, revealing that he hid the remnants of the original Marvel and DC universes within Batman and Captain America. He allows the Spectre and the Living Tribunal access to that power, letting them restore the two universes to normal. And unfortunately, the effect is a bit of a letdown. We see one page with a few heroes getting split up by this, then a two-page spread of various heroes, but not very many. Sure, there probably wasn't time to draw, say, a Crisis on Infinite Earths level of characters, but I've got to imagine that was the initial hope, and I would have recruited a ton of other artists to come in. A spread of DC and Marvel characters together? You could sell that as a poster on its own. Access, a twig caught in a hurricane, is buffeted mercilessly, and he is convinced that the thought currently passing through his head is going to be his last, and frustration overwhelms him because it's a really lame thought. Wait, the Amalgam Universe was the only reality left where Arby's potato cakes existed. Damn it! Access, Batman, and Captain America are back in the alley, realizing that their realities are still partially merged, but at least they're alive. For some reason, much like the Mole Men being in the Batcave earlier, the Hulk has somehow ended up there too. The Batcave is the grand central station of the multiverse. He fights the Mole Man's forces until Superman suddenly shows up to help, blocking a blast from his greatest weapon. Anyway, Access tries to explain what happened to him, Morty in the box, though Cap and Bats have little to no idea what he's talking about, which is kind of a small problem with the story. Not a really bad one, just, you know, we'll get to that in the conclusion. The Spectre and the Living Tribunal note that people have changed where they were before the merging, but that doesn't matter now because the brothers are pissed and we get some much better artistic renderings of the sheer scope of their pissed offness. Pants to be darkened seems inadequate to describe this scene. But enough of that, Perry White and J. Jonah Jameson are pissed at the Kingpin for interfering with the Daily Planet's operations, and fortunately Spider-Man and Superboy arrive to kick his ass and tell him to sell the Daily Planet. Truly the plot point we were all worried about. Robin and Jubilee ended up in Venice and are now just making out in a gondola because... Well, why not? They were already joined together once today in the Amalgam Universe anyway. So we don't actually get a Darkseid versus Thanos fight, as instead Thanos is going around trying to find Darkseid to fight him, but finds himself fighting Wolverine and Lobo instead. Darkseid shows up to fight him, but then Thor, Captain Marvel, Wonder Woman, Storm, Green Lantern, and Silver Surfer are on hand to bring out the big guns against them. And hey, it's very fun to see Marvel characters kicking Darkseid's ass while the DC ones take on Thanos, with one fun bit where Thor drops Mjolnir and Wandy just casually hands it back to him. However, an event like this certainly qualifies as a crisis level event, so naturally the sky turns red. But for a terrible, surreal, horrific reason. The sky is bleeding. Blood is raining down from the sky. The visuals are not as fully realized as I think they could be, but just the concept of the sky bleeding. Not just describing it as, you know, raining blood, but actually bleeding is one of those apocalyptic images that stuck in my head since I was a kid. Kudos, comic. Batman and Captain America demand to be taken to the brothers to try to get them to see reason, though Access thinks that won't do any good. They're transported to the realm of the brothers, Access explaining that the place is more like a higher state of consciousness rather than a physical locale. It's where deja vu and racial memory come from. So it's really happening, but it's all in our minds. So here, I can will one face into non-existence! 
My greatest enemy defeated once and for all! On Earth, nobody really knows what to do as they watch the end of the world. Clark going back to Lois for the end. Well, Jameson, gonna take one last pot shot at me? For what it's worth, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, clearly my 100% accurate journalism on your villainy has led you to destroy the world like this. I may have taken things too far. The brothers have erupted into full-scale combat, with only the Spectre and the Living Tribunal to hold them back, and failing miserably at it. Cap suggests they go back and raise an army, but Access points out the Spectre is more powerful than a billion armies, and he's not doing jack against them. And you're saying this is all some kind of cosmic state of mind? Basically, yeah. Okay, my next idea might seem pretty wild, but hear me out. I think we should summon the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Cap says they have to change their minds and try to leap up to the fray. Back on Earth, they are witnessing the end of everything. Their thoughts, their fears, horror, regrets, they are all private. Well, except for all the vampires on either Earth who are dancing outside right now going, Woo! Christmas for bloodsuckers! All save for one who chooses to give voice to his. A voice that speaks with the hush of a newly dying star. As Thanos says, It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. See, Stark? This is how much blood you should be getting for all that effort. Cap, Batman, and Access fail to get the attention of the brothers, until their clash sends out energy waves throughout the mental realm, which causes both heroes' lives to flash before their eyes, and the eyes of the brothers. They see Batman's origins and how that led him to protect the innocent from turning his dark pain and anger into good. He became one among many, but remained forever unique. See, you say that, but I could own both Turbojet Batman and Infrared Batman at the same time. And then they see Cap's origins. A strong spirit, but weak flesh, and an experiment to better himself to fight evil. A battle that carried him over many more decades than one would think, and yet retaining his morals and inspirational quality when the world grew darker and more cynical. He became one among many, but remained forever unique. Except when a living cosmic cube made a Nazi clone of him. That was annoying. The brothers, seeing these unique, interesting signs of each other's universes, what it actually means, and two of their best representatives, finally stop and realize that their squabble is so small compared to the beings in their universes. A billion years pass as they sit and stare at each other, contemplating all this. But eventually, the brothers, for the first time in recorded and unrecorded history, speak, and they say the same thing. You've done well. And then they look at their younger sibling, Image, and say, You could do better. History rolls back in on itself, and the universes are fully separated. Most don't know what happened, but everyone is shaken up by it, either humbled by the experience, or mourning what they lost from that merging. The only one who fully knows what happened is Access. The truth of the brothers' realization that their creations had surpassed the creators themselves. Although they should still be getting royalties from them, at least. Access fancies himself a seeker of truth and decides to reject the truth of what happened so he can keep on seeking out new truths, exploring what else there is out there. And so our comic ends with these words. And when universes beckon, which of us could say no? Yeah, we could put them on hold at least. This comic is good, but not as good as I remember. Its biggest issue is how short it is. Four issues, even extra length ones like these, is not a lot of time to do all these fights and the fun character moments we want to see. Sure, the moments we do get are good, but they're fleeting, and the pacing is very fast and a bit disjointed, as pointed out where we suddenly have moments like the Hulk and Superman versus the Mole Man and the Batcave fight. That gets interrupted by, you know, the plot. Just quite a bit of tone whiplash of fun crossover stuff and then, oh by the way, the sky is raining blood! Of course, we might have had more time to enjoy the crossover stuff if Access wasn't so much a focus of the comic. Now, Access is not terrible. He's actually rather interesting in that he's a character jointly owned by Marvel and DC, but he doesn't really contribute much to the story other than being a bit of a MacGuffin. It's not a huge problem, but because we have to keep cutting to him to advance the plot along, that means less time with the heroes. Maybe the story could have been written in a way that gets the same point across, but without him. Maybe Doctor Fate and Doctor Strange transport them to the weird mental realm place at the end, and the Marvel and DC psychics are the ones who exposit about the brothers instead of Access and Morty. That kind of thing. The fights themselves are mostly fine, but feel a bit too short. And sure, part of that is because they wanted to include a lot of them, but again, 
four issues means so much is left out. I think I would have preferred six. Still plenty of stuff that wouldn't make it in, but also more room for the fights and crossover fun. As it stands though, Marvel vs. DC or DC vs. Marvel remains a fun crossover between the companies. I'd say JLA slash Avengers is still better since it's paced better and has more of the crossover stuff we want to see, plus George Perez fitting in a million characters on each page. But for what it was in the 90s, it ain't terrible. And I like that it ends with the brothers finding peace. Marvel and DC don't have to be hateful rivals. They can be colleagues and acknowledge how much they like each other and want the other to succeed. They're not perfect, most certainly, but they've done well. Next time, reordering the schedule a bit. Haven't canceled anything yet, but I feel like with how things have been going lately, I'm accelerating my plans a bit for this show's superstitions. Kickers Incorporated number two will get pushed back again, so we can have more Mr. T and the T-Force. Oh, and there's actually a follow-up to Marvel vs. DC called All Access that led to the second round of Amalgam Comics, and I'll probably cover that at some point, too. Hello, my friends. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon, buy merch from the store envy link in the description, or check out the t-shirts available from Teespring. Thanks for watching.